Now for our first session today, new money. We'll be looking at the role of regulation. With governments around the world struggling to get to grips with the crypto revolution, what are they going to do? Is the crypto space, as some allege, really like the Wild West? Okay, let's jump into the news everyone's talking about. That executive order, President Biden's directive, calls for agencies like the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve to ramp up research into regulating crypto in the U.S. Some real food for thought there. Well, now I'm delighted to be able to introduce our absolutely splendid panel for this session. Hester Peirce, Commissioner of the US Securities and Exchange Commission. Welcome to you, Hester. Also, we have Thank you. Kate. It's lovely to be here. Fantastic. Also, we have Kate Pentis Rosimanis, Finance Minister of Estonia. Really great to have you here as well. Thank you. Great to be here. Douglas Landy, co-head of the Financial Institutions Industry Group at White and Case. Hello there, Doug. Thank you. Good morning from New York. Good morning. And Dante Desparte, Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Global Policy at Circle. Welcome, Dante. Thank you. Great to be here. Great to have you all here. But first, who better to kick us off than Raghuram Raja, former governor of the Reserve Bank of India. Where do we stand on the whole issue of cryptocurrency and regulation? Regulators are trying to understand what exactly is going on. It's grown much larger than they would be comfortable with without regulation. They are an investment vehicle for a lot of people. And any investment vehicle requires a certain amount of regulation just to make sure these aren't fly-by-night operators who take your money and run. And especially in an area where, you know, we have 6,000 plus cryptocurrencies, we have a lot of people who have issued versions of the same kind of digital asset. Who knows whether they're legitimate or not? And so that uh, requires a certain amount of regulation, at least uh, registering to make sure that you're uh, on the up and up rather than uh, a fly-by-night operator. When you're pretending to be something which causes risks to the system. So an example of that is a stable coin, which basically says, I'm gonna take your money whenever you want to redeem your token or your crypto, you will get that money back. It's the same kind of promise a bank makes with your deposits. And in order for that to work, you have to be fairly confident that the money is there or the bank can access that money if need be to pay you back, especially when everybody comes for their money. So a stablecoin has what is called run risk. One reason that banks are regulated is because they have run risk. And if everybody thinks everybody else is coming for their money, they want their money also, and then the bank is run upon. So for this reason, something that says you'll get your money back needs to be regulated to make sure that it has the ability to raise liquidity when everybody comes for their money and you're there to pay it back. Are you becoming a vehicle for uh, people to make payments which are illegal? Are you making payments to entities that are illegal? Are illegal entities, the mafia, drug dealers, you know, a big player in your payment system? I think they're trying to scramble to understand better. The dilemma for regulators is how to allow the search 
while limiting the extent of risk, uh, both for this, the financial system, the crypto system, as well as for the public. The one concern the authorities have to have is that regulation shouldn't be a stamp of approval. Because we have regulated these things, the value is certified, so go ahead and invest. I don't think you want to put that stamp at this point until we understand better the nature of the beast. Raghuram Rajan there. Now, just one more reminder. We'd love it if you can help share the word today. So please do stop checking the Bitcoin price for just a moment and jump on social media using the hashtag PS events. In around half an hour, we'll be opening up to take questions from journalists around the world. But first, let's dive into the discussion. And I'd like to ask uh, Hester, uh, first of all, uh, the opening film, of course, looked at the idea that cryptocurrencies are a kind of wild west. Now, you're a commissioner of the SEC and you're one of the potential sheriffs. So, Hester, why is regulating cryptocurrency fundamentally different to traditional finance? Well, first, I have to say that my views represent my own views and not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. And I think that's important uh, to underscore in this context. I've taken a bit of a different view than, than some of my colleagues on the way that we should approach regulating crypto. Um, now, clearly, if people are engaged in activities that fall within our jurisdiction, um, they should be complying with our rules. But one of the things that Congress did when it um, set us up and gave us our, our statutory framework, it told us that we could make accommodations so that we could achieve our regulatory objectives in a way that made sense, while also allowing new and different um, types of, of things to happen in our space. So accommodating innovation while still meeting our regulatory objectives. And that's something that I would like to see us use with respect to crypto. There are a number of areas where applying the securities laws exactly as we've applied them to traditional finance just doesn't make sense. Um, it, it essentially becomes a compliance exercise that, that can undermine the very value of the technology. And so um, I would like us to embrace some of the, the spirit of adventure and, and entrepreneurship that um, characterizes this industry while also addressing some of the, the, the real concerns um, and doing that in a way that, that makes sense um, for our investor protection and market stability objectives, but also um, for allowing people to, to try and experiment. And, and, and you know, some, some of those experiments will fail, some won't, but um, allowing that experimentation to happen. It's a very tricky tightrope though, isn't it? That you've got to try and uh, balance on, and there are so, still so many gray areas, aren't there? Well, it's a tricky tightrope, but we have mechanisms to make it less tricky. We, we could be having public conversations in a, in, a, in a manner that allows everyone who's interested and knowledgeable people to weigh in in a, in a transparent manner so that if someone says something, someone else can say, well, wait a minute, that's not exactly true. That's how we should be doing this. That's how our regulatory framework works best when we when we engage in this transparent public dialogue about what the rules should look like. Um, that's something that we haven't done so far in this space. And I think it's really hindering us. That's what's making it so difficult to regulate in this space. OK, Hester, thank you so much. Well, let me uh, pass to Kate now. And Kate, I'd like to show you uh, this graph coming up. It's based on a Deutsche Bank projection of the growth of blockchain adoption compared to the early days of the Internet. Now, uh, first up, it's the Internet and beneath it we can see blockchain. Now, it's worth noting that the number of Internet users is counted in billions compared to blockchains, hundreds of millions. And also the dotted line showing the blockchain projection is fairly large. So I have two questions for you. First of all, do you think it represents a likely picture of things to come? And, and second, as a minister, how do you anticipate the problems thrown up by something that evolves just so rapidly? I think it is rather li likely a uh, scenario, yes. And um, I think one um, uh, crucial thing to, uh, to realize and accept is that the tech innovation um, in a broader sense, as well as the crypto um, blockchain uh, technology is there to stay. So it's not just something uh, 
that uh, appears as a trend and will disappear um, in in um, uh, in upcoming years or or very soon. But it's something that uh, has had an enormous enormous um, uh, growth uh, that we have witnessed and. Uh, at, at, it will be there, and as a regulator um, or as a, um, as somebody uh, who is representing um, the government sector, um, our approach in Estonia has been to uh, not just accept it, but to become uh, also one of the front runners um, when it comes to basically taking advantage of it. Um, when we um, actually decided uh, to choose the digital path uh, in Estonia that was a few decades ago uh, then um, it was a very knowingly made uh, decision or a choice you know, to, to to take that path and we now see that it's um, in a way it's um, our obligation also to um, um, to um, offer um, a very uh, secure and friendly um, legal framework to uh, digital, uh, to sorry, to, to fintech, um, to um, uh, financial innovation as well. So this is why we have really chosen to um, uh, to um, uh, introduce um, some of the legislation uh, that focuses um, on uh, on the crypto on the virtual assets uh, mainly virtual asset providers and um, I think the tricky question here is uh, how to balance it in a way that uh, we will have the regulations uh, in place but yet there is enough room for innovation as well so that uh, we won't um, make a mistake to over regulate it um, so we have um, uh, decided to first to um, to focus or to um, uh, to describe the risks that we see, and then to focus uh, um, how to um, how to minimize the uh, likelihood of those risks to um, uh, to realize. So um, it is yet, um, of course, um, a sort of um, new. Um, uh, regulatory um, parts, uh, but in Estonia, for example, we actually started to license already the uh, virtual asset uh, providers uh, in okay. 2017. So it's already five years um, ago when we started with it. So you're and well with... along the path. You're well along the path then, Kate, and, and certainly you're there outlining uh, those risks. And I imagine part of the risk is that there are so many different products that get labeled cryptocurrency. They're fundamentally very different. So I want to bring in Doug now. Doug, which of these products do you think needs more attention? Well, I, I do think it is important to differentiate sometimes between some of the terms here. Crypto, on the one hand, is a product. Blockchain, perhaps, be seen as more of a technology. Um, you know, one is being used for investment consumer purposes. The other can be used for um, more um, broader based purposes by behind the scenes players building up financial architecture and, and so on. Um, and certainly, you know, one, the product may be needed to regulate in one way to protect the consumers, um, provide disclosure and so on. And the other may not be need to be regulated in the same way. Um, there is a difference. The growth in um, the crypto and blockchain markets in the United States the last four or five years has been incredible. Um, and we are facing an oncoming regulatory response now. Just in the last week or two, I mean, uh, in our intro, um, it was mentioned about the president's um, executive order in March, right? We're a little over a month since then. We've had proposed legislation in the Senate from Senator Toomey. We've had um, several large speeches by um, Acting Controller Sue. And the FDIC putting out um, a letter explaining to its banks what they need to do in order to start engaging in digital assets. Um, so on the one hand, we see that there is forming a regulatory response in the market. On the other hand, while I think everybody wishes the rules were more clear, it, there hasn't really been any evidence that that has stopped investment in the market. The market is far larger in the United States than it was, say, three, four years ago at this point. Absolutely. Well, I just want to move on to Dante now, because Dante, in his opening film that we, we saw, Raghuram Rajan spoke about the danger of run risk 
with stable coins. Now your organization, Circle, is the issuer of USD coin, the second largest stable coin by market capitalization. So what do you make of his remarks? Well, run risk and frankly, buyers and spenders remorse were two of the original sins of the uh, cryptocurrency industry when it was first brought to light with Bitcoin. And we should remember an industry first brought to light after the 2008 financial crisis in which we privatized gain and socialized losses to the tune of trillions and trillions of dollars. And so in some respects, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and blockchains and then ultimately stable coins are a market response to very broad financial market failures. And behind them, there are a couple of core questions I always ask. Is it really your money if you have to ask someone to spend it and if you have to pay someone to hold it for you? And so this idea that you have a mobile native, internet native form of money, it should also, of course, be trusted. And, and therein lies, I think, an area where Circle primarily has uh, put a lot of attention to this fundamental set of questions around trust, transparency, auditability, and then run risk. Most um, stable coins in circulation, certainly through the earlier period of time, and, and perhaps even today, would fail to meet an even basic question of show me the money. Um, so stable coins are asset reference tokens that are meant to solve for buyers and spenders remorse by providing a stable uh, unit of account and, and medium of exchange on the internet. But many up until now have had, um, let's say, trouble and maybe have fallen into the category of vaporware. Um, in our case, we believe in a regulation first model very much as uh, Commissioner Pierce had outlined in, in the beginning. And we think these belong under frameworks uh, close to banking or payments or e-money, you know, effectively giving people more control over how they send, spend, save and secure their money in the 21st century. OK, thanks, Dante. Well, let me bring back in uh, Hester. What do you make of Dante's comments then that uh, really this has been a reaction to what happened during the financial crisis? And do you think there is a real risk that actually there are a number of coins out there that simply don't show us the money? Well, I certainly do think that crypto, many aspects of what's going on in crypto are a response to concerns that arose during the financial crisis and, and attempts by people to address um, problems that surfaced in the financial crisis in, in interesting and novel ways. Um, so I think that that's, that's on the positive side. I mean, again, we're talking in, in very broad terms. And so, of course, there, there are um, some parts of this world that are, are much more transparent than others and, and people need to be asking questions and they need to be bringing the same kind of skepticism they bring um, to anything else in their financial lives. Now, when it comes to figuring out the regu right regulatory approach, I, I think around stable coins, we're, we're having that conversation now, as, as was mentioned, um, Senator Toomey just introduced a, a, a bill that would allow for some different um, uh, different regulatory approaches you could you could choose from among um, from among several approaches so and others have suggested the SEC could have a role um, so there there's a lot of work still to be done but I think we all agree that you know the, the basic the basic goal is to make sure that people are able to see what's backing um, the stable coin and, and are able to have confidence in that um, and and that would be the objective we'd be trying to achieve. Well, thanks very much uh, for outlining that, Hester. Um, I just want to bring back in Kate now, because, Kate, I'd like you to take a look at this headline from Bloomberg back in October 2021, looking at a tightening of regulation in Estonia. Now, of course, you were the first country in the world to issue licenses to cryptocurrencies. Tell us exactly why and, and what happened. Um, again, it was... Um it was a decision made to um to um uh, well let's put it this way that uh, it was very clear that uh this is a sector that will uh, will be booming um and uh i think basically there were two options whether to to just sit back and see how the wild west will uh, will regulate itself if it will or let others uh to come up with the regulations or or then to be among those who um who actually um will uh, frame the, the future regulations as well. And uh, we chose the, the latter one. And, uh, we started with uh, licensing uh, the virtual asset providers uh, in 2017. 
And uh, just very recently, a few months ago, we, we updated um, uh, the, uh, the current uh, regulations so that um, we would have a more transparent sector. I think what is really important that I, that I want to highlight here is that uh, we are also um, having um, 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 technology neutral uh, solution. So we are not, uh, not regulating or, uh, or um, uh, uh, creating um, uh, frames for a specific uh, technology. And I think this is really crucial in this mm -hmm. world, but we are re regulating and setting um, uh, frames to the uh, uh, virtual asset providers um, um, mm -hmm. as entities. So there is um, there is a rather uh, I think big um, uh, difference and important difference okay. as well. Where we saw where the risks were uh, uh, were that uh, several companies that took uh, the Estonian licenses had really nothing to do with Estonia, and that makes us uh, or put us in a bit different uh, and difficult situation. So that uh, should there. Um, should, should any of the risks um, uh, materialize um, uh, Estonian um, other uh, virtual asset providers uh, will um, or would have um, had um, um, the negative effects that they would share. Uh, but the, uh, those who were operating had, in fact, really nothing to do with Estonia. So now we have uh, an, um, an obligation um, um, set in place that those who get the Estonian license also uh, has to um, have um, be based in Estonia connections with Estonia exactly okay so Doug uh, let me bring you in when you look around the world where do you think which countries do you think which jurisdictions are getting regulation right and why uh, Kate there talked about the problems experienced in Estonia I don't think anybody has fully figured out the issue yet. And of course, one of the great things about the technology is that it's international, right? It can cross national boundaries um, quickly. I mean, we do see efforts from the global bodies like the Financial Stability Board, uh, the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements and, and other related ones to start to set standards to um, handle international money payment flows using digital assets. Um, and I think we'll see more coming from that. As we know, there are dozens and dozens of countries studying central bank digital currencies, which I think we'll probably speak to a bit later, and um, looking at some of the issues that come along with those types of technology when employed. Um, again, I can only really speak to the US and perhaps the UK a little bit, which is where I practice. I think the UK has done some great things, certainly their sandbox um, style of regulation for building up smaller companies was successful. There's several um, examples of that. In the US, we can't really do sandboxes. We don't have that authority. However, we certainly have seen um, a lot of talk about the regulatory perimeter here, what should be regulated and what should not be. And that perimeter has been moving in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. in the last perhaps four years or so, um, to account for digital assets and the regulation. And perhaps we'll continue to move as regulators sort of extend to where the risk is. And one thing I'd just like to mention is, you know, among the risks that have been really considered here, it was in the president's executive order, it was in the, the president's working group from November of last year, is financial stability looking at the risks of um, these products on a national scale, which really then looks at them perhaps on more of a global scale, given the extent of the US economy and its reaches, um, mm -hmm. looking at them not as individual products, but the effect of them and the effect of the users and the companies that employ them on the financial stability of the United States economy itself. And yeah. so there are you know, various ways of regulating, right? You look at the entity, you look at the product. Now we're looking at the country as well. Absolutely. OK, well, let me pass over to Dante, because there, of course, Doug's highlighting uh, the potential for systemic risk and presumably stablecoin issuers like Circle would really like to see some kind of regulation on capital requirements to weed out bad actors. As you said before, some players have an inability to perhaps show the money when it really matters. But what should that look like? 
Well, in our view, it should be pretty straightforward, right? And in fact, we think much of the practice that we have put in place around USDC and trust and transparency of USDC, which is over $50 billion in circulation, is that you should have a sound money approach, right? Unlike traditional banks, which are taking your dollar and then fractionalizing a share of that dollar effectively to put out leverage and put out loans in the economy, the totality of our reserves are first and foremost held in order to uh, provide backing to all of the USDC tokens in circulation. That's one standard. The composition of those assets should also be very conservative so that you do not introduce undue risk or volatility to the stablecoin. Um, the second piece of the puzzle is to be able to withstand public scrutiny in the form of attestations, of the sufficiency of reserves, the composition of reserves over time. And then lastly, I think it's really critical, a company like Circle has created a cottage industry in the banking sector for asset management partnerships and for um, effectively the, the reserve management process. Just yesterday, we announced a major investment in the company from major institutional players like BlackRock, Fidelity, Marshall Waste in the UK and others. That just demonstrates, I think, a possibility where this becomes mainstream financial markets infrastructure and much less jargon ridden as we would not even once mention the word blockchain or cryptocurrencies several years from today, because I think the technology will fade to the deep background. Okay, well, Kate would like to come in here. So Kate, uh, what would you like to say on Dante's point? Um, I, um, I just want to um, um, also explain that, uh, again, coming to Estonia, we, uh, we, we actually did choose between the two um, different approach. One uh, was um, a basically a rules-based uh, or a rules-centered approach where everything uh, to, the, uh, high, to the smallest details would be, um, uh, would be um, set uh, and, 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 and framed by the laws. And the other option was a risk-based or a risk-centered uh, solution. And we should choose, uh, choose the latter one again. Um, we saw that um, that the um, solution where actually the rule making um, has been delegated to the entities themselves um, is uh, and can be uh, rather effective. So um, we know what the risks are and uh, the uh, task to, to mitigate the risk uh, is there, but how exactly uh, those risks uh, will be mitigated uh, uh, should not be, and I personally think that cannot be really um, regulated by the law because, again, the technology changes um, uh, very fast. The whole sector uh, changes very fast uh, and it would be impossible to update uh, all the rules uh, in the law um, mm -hmm. every time um, a new solution comes up. So the risk-based uh, solution is something that might work um, to our understanding better uh, when it comes to, to, the, um, uh, to the sector. Okay, Kate. Well, thank you very much. It certainly seems that there are so many uh, different angles to this. We're going to come to a few more in just a moment, but don't forget, we'd love you to get involved with today's event. So please do help spread the word using the hashtag PS event. So I'd like to come to Doug now. And Doug, um, we've talked to quite a lot about regulation, but just one pretty direct question. What would bad regulation look like to you? Sure. Um, and I may have mentioned or failed to mention I'm an ex Federal Reserve lawyer. So I come at um, regulation from uh, a training of their point of view, um, which is a little bit different from what Commissioner Pierce has done, although similar goals and aims. Um, bad regulation and it would certainly look like one that squashes innovation um, fails to protect people in the proper way, um, entrenches existing monopolies, um, and keeps competition from occurring, and in general, um, just um, limits the ability of entities in the United States to compete globally. Um, now, regulation, of course, is is not a fixed thing. It goes back and forth. We've certainly seen that in this country, just looking the last 14 to 15 years from just before the financial crisis to now, we've seen several times where regulation has been tightened through legislation or otherwise, then, then relax a little bit more. Now it perhaps is being tightened a little bit again. So, you know, there is no one right way to do things. The, the proper way to do it, of course, is for the regulators to be listening to the stakeholders, industry, um, Congress, other people, 
um, lobbyists, consumer groups, et cetera, and adjusting the regulation mm -hmm. as is necessary to achieve those goals. Well, that uh, leads me very nicely on, thanks very much, Doug, to this tweet from Congressman Tom Emma. And uh, Hester, I'd like your view on this. It says crypto startups must not be weighed down by extra jurisdictional and burdensome reporting requirements. We will ensure our regulators do not kill American innovation and opportunities. Now, he was one of eight congressmen who recently wrote to the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, asking whether the agency's investigations into crypto are consistent with the Paperwork Reduction Act. Do you have any sympathy for his concerns? Well, I certainly don't want to speak to any ongoing enforcement investigation, but I, I think that there are some real concerns about the way we've approached this space. And again, I, you know, it goes back to needing to have public, transparent conversations as we try to figure out what the right regulatory approach is, rather than trying to take a one-off approach where we, maybe we craft um, a settlement with with a particular entity that might work for that entity, but that will. Um, not work for, for the rest of the industry. Um, I think we need to really retain a mix of wonder at the new innovation. You know, there's something delightful about seeing new innovation, but also a skepticism. We need to, um, as Kate mentioned, you know, tech, technology neutrality is good. Sometimes you have to make adjustments to recognize certain aspects of the technology, but your rules should be written in a way that they're principles based. Um, and then you should also look at ways that you can, you as the regulator, can take advantage of the new technologies to do things better. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But I think, you know, the, the, the way to do this is to do it in public instead of to, to try to have um, these sort of back, back room conversations with individual market participants. OK, well, let me bring in Doug now. I know he wants to uh, make a comment on this point. Well, just the tweets and, you know, we do hear those words constantly. I think you're perhaps wading into politics a little more than perhaps you may want in this comment. But I think, you know, I'm a very factual, data-driven person. And there just is no evidence of that right now, that, you know, the either regulatory uncertainty or um, potential regulation of the sector has been driving capital and innovation offshore. In fact, the last four years clearly show the opposite. Right. Companies have moved here. Um, they've tried to move here. I mean, we could say a lot about making it easier to move here. Absolutely. You know, there are barriers to entry that, um, you know, perhaps arise mostly in the banking sector, but also in other places that people should look at because we do want people to come in. But the mm -hmm. fact that um, we're starting to regulate either crypto or, or blockchain on a wholesale basis just has there's no evidence of anything driving anybody anywhere. OK, well, thanks very much for that, Doug. Let me bring in Dante. What's your view on this? Well, some some have taken this idea of a digital currency space race as a zero sum game and that for for a very long period of time, the United States was being framed as a net loser of the digital currency space race. I actually took to the pages of Project Syndicate and wrote sort of a counter narrative about how in many ways the United States and the dollar is already becoming the currency of the internet in no small measure because of the sum of activity that both Commissioner Pierce described and, and Doug described, described a moment ago. And then certainly if we look at a company like Circle is licensed in the US from sea to shining sea. And so when we say that the industry is not well regulated, I have um, a whole country of state uh, banking supervisors and commissioners who would beg to differ. The question is there's a void of federal regulation and the void of federal regulation blunts American competition in this space overseas because the states do not have a seat at the Bank for International Settlements, the Financial Action Task Force, the Financial Stability Board. Therein, we are represented by our federal authorities. And oftentimes, we're left uh, alone to compete with the entire planet. And so I think that's the gap that, that we aim to fill, hopefully, in, in U.S. policy. OK, Hester, could I, could I bring you in here? What's your take on that? Do you think there is a, a gap to fill in policy? Yeah, I mean, I certainly disagree with Doug about the 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 fact that I, I what I hear from people all the time is that if there were more regulatory clarity, there would be more more people coming into this space, and there'd be more comfort about doing things. We now see innovators um, in this space and project developers in this space spending a ton of time thinking about regulation when I'd rather have them thinking about 
trying to make what they're doing better. Um, if we had clearer regulation or if we allowed for experimentation in, you know, with, with regulatory parameters, um, there'd be a lot more activity going on in this space. So I, I, I just, I think it's a mistake for us to assume that everything's going to happen in the U.S. because everything has, a, a lot of activity always has happened in the U.S. If we don't get this right, I really think things will move overseas. Doug, do you not think that there's a need for more clarity? Oh, I, I agree with what Hester is saying. I, I didn't intend to give the impression that we didn't need clarity. But I think what we're talking about instead is whether if clarity comes down and says, you know, we're going to apply Howie and the 90 years of securities law to the crypto space, that's clarity. But that's not what the industry wants or what Hester has said. And I think you know, there's a lot of good points she has made on that. So I'm not at all dis disputing clarity, but I think the argument is if there's more clarity than the industry wants, will that drive innovation offshore? And that I'm not sure about. I, I don't see any evidence of that yet. I think the inherent advantages of the US, um, both in its dollar-based mm -hmm. economy, um, in its clarity of law and certainty of outcome, um, certainly, have so far outweighed, you know, all of the regulatory hurdles here. The example I always give is, you know, we have the most heavily regulated um, capital markets in the world, but we also have the deepest and most liquid capital markets in the world. So more regulation doesn't always mean less business, less innovation, but it okay. does raise compliance costs, hurdles, and so on. And I, that's why I was mentioning sort of the regulatory pendulum before. It's important Absolutely. not to view it as a fixed thing. It's important to try constantly to be getting it right. Well, I'm going to take that pendulum and swing it over to Kate now and get her view on this discussion, particularly given uh, the experience in Estonia. Kate, what's your take on this? My experience says that um, um, regulation uh, particularly if it is a um, regulation in, um, in a new sphere or a relatively new regulation uh, will function well if it is uh, designed uh, with the stakeholders that uh, it will have an uh, impact on. And, uh, and this is, uh, again, I will come back to Estonian example and our experience uh, creating the whole digital nation uh, we started uh, with uh, the uh, IT, the digital sector, um, a few decades ago, and now I think it it applies also to um, to uh, trying to create a regulatory framework for uh, uh, for fintech for uh, for crypto as well, uh, crypto world. And um, my. Uh, recent experience says that actually the interest um, uh, of uh, having a transparent, um, well-functioning, smooth um, and um, innovation-friendly framework um, uh, is exactly the same for, uh, for the stakeholders, for the sector, as well as uh, for the regulators. What is the difference, uh, and I'm not talking about the US right now, but um, uh, about our own experience, is that the level of knowledge and understanding of how this um, relatively new uh, part of, of the uh, fintech world uh, functions uh, is, is a bit different among the regulators and among the se uh, sector. Mm -hmm. And this is um, something that um, every now and then still has an effect as well. And uh, mm -hmm. while being very self-critical towards uh, the regulators, I say that there is certainly also a need uh, to um, uh, very quickly um, basically educate um, uh, ourselves as regulators uh, to be up to the task that uh, we have in front of us. It's certainly a big task. OK, well, we've got to wrap up this discussion shortly and take some questions from journalists. But before we do, Dante, I'd just like to take you on a trip down memory lane with this clip from 2019. 
Facebook announcing a new digital currency called Libra, and Facebook says this digital currency aims to make it as easy to send money around the world as it is to send a photo. Now, the currency is set to launch in the first half of next year, and it will be run not by Facebook, but by a nonprofit in Switzerland. And unlike Bitcoin, Libra, this digital currency, will be backed by real money. So if you put in a dollar or some other currency into Libra, you'll get a dollar or the equivalent out. Now, the goal is for that that reserve of real money to make the whole currency more stable, um, unlike Bitcoin, which is obviously very volatile. Dante, what a difference a few years make. Uh, now, for anybody watching who doesn't know how that story ended up, Facebook's Libra was later named DM. However, it was met with a really harsh response from regulators and was eventually dropped. And last week, news emerged that Meta, as Facebook is now called, of course, has new plans for what's been called Zuck Bucks. What are the lessons here then, Dante? Well, a, a great trip down memory lane. Um, so as, as the listeners may know, I was once upon a time the uh, vice chairman of the Libra Association. So I've had a front row seat in the conversation globally about the future of finance, payments and money. And all I can say is that if to understand the future, past is prologue. Any kind of innovation, depending on who the sponsor is of the innovation, will either import the good and the bad attributes and the trust or the mistrust of those sponsors. But I would point out in hindsight, looking at the world and looking at our inability to move money at population scale through the course of COVID-19, we shaved off $200 billion from cross-border payments or remittances from the people who could afford it the least. Whole countries and fortress nations like the United States moved trillions of dollars of government funded money to citizens across the country to prop up weak se segments of the economy. But we, we subjected that money to very slow, antiquated, leaky pipes. And so the advent of instant, real-time, safe ways of moving money, and then to have changed the form factor of money into a, a trusted uh, instrument like USDC, I think these are really, really important innovations today being framed somewhat as competing with the traditional financial system. But I think if we get it right, we're completing a lot of unfinished work. Your and my financial needs do not take bank holidays, but yet the banking system shuts down and the banking system is anything but global and anything but interoperable. So I think these types of innovations are really critical. And the Libra project in many ways was one of the, the catalyst mm -hmm. of a lot of the efforts among central banks and others to understand this space. Yeah, and it's certainly watch this space. OK, well, now it's time to open up the floor to questions from journalists around the world who've been uh, watching this. So first of all, a question from Catherine Duan from Sina Finance. And uh, she sent in this question on April the 4th, SE Chair Gary Gensler announced several initiatives to expand investor protections in the two trillion dollar cryptocurrency market. So what important cryptocurrency regulatory policies do you think will come out next? So I'm going to put that question first to Hester. Well, again, I've, I've objected to the fact that we haven't really taken a clear um, regulatory approach. We've taken much more of an enforcement centric approach. And I think sometimes that approach just manifests itself in ways that don't make any sense for investor protection. So I, I hope we'll see a, a transition from that. But, um, you know, you see, for example, in, in, in the results of our, of our uh, efforts that mean that people can't get access to products that they were using. I'm not sure that's a very good outcome. So I hope whatever it is we do will be um, designed to, to allow people to use these products and services. I mean, I think one area that Chair Gensler has really spoken a lot about, and I expect that in this year we'll see, we'll see him speaking more about it is, is the regulation of crypto trading platforms at the federal level, which is something that um, he certainly wants to do. He recently mentioned that he would be willing to do that in conjunction with the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And that I think would be a valuable conversation for us to be having um, together with our sister regulator. Although Congress may decide that they that that someone else should be the regulator of crypto trading platforms, not not either the SEC or the CFTC. OK, so let me put that same uh, question uh, to uh, Kate. I mean, what do you think about future uh, regulation? What else would you like to see? Perhaps actually regulation coming from uh, the US. Well, I will not take that slippery slope and uh, <laughs> uh, comment too much on, on the on the possible US um, um, uh, developments. But uh, um, I'd rather say that um, 
I think those who still, those states and countries that still do not have uh, much of the uh, regulation in place, that uh, very soon we will see uh, rather rapid uh, reactions there. And uh, I'm afraid that the first reaction will be to, to over-regulate uh, the whole sector, which is something that um, I think should actually be avoided. Uh, I would rather see that uh, the regulator, uh, re regulations um, we have um, in place, um, that uh, we should concentrate to implement them now. And also, since we are talking about the fintech, um, uh, the regulations that, um, that regulate the fintech uh, sector, I would also uh, very much like to see more um, opportunities and possibilities given to the technology itself. Uh, again, we don't need to have um, a very burdensome uh, uh, reporting um, regulations in place if we have a technolo technological solution that could uh, solve the similar problem uh, with a um, much uh, less uh, time and, uh, um, and uh, in, in an easier manner for uh, entities. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, I think one of the... Um, uh, regulations that uh, will be uh, uh, discussed uh, a lot uh, is um, how uh, we can um, implement and should we implement uh, the travel rule also in the um, uh, and for uh, for the um, uh, virtual asset service providers and again uh, if if that will be um, um, a demand um, uh, how we can um, use uh, the technological solution there to make uh, the final um, uh, solution easier for, for the service providers. Okay. But uh, my personal, uh, um, let's say I, I would certainly favor that instead of uh, keep on uh, um, in inventing new regulations, we will focus on what we have already in place and make this those really work uh, and implement them uh, in, a, in a proper manner. So focus on what we have right now. OK, thank you very much, uh, Kate and uh, Hester, for those responses. Let me hand over now to, Cal to the reporter from Khalid Times in the UAE. Could you please introduce yourself and uh, pose the question? Sure. Hi, Susan. Nice to meet all of you. Uh, my name is Sandhya Dimello. I'm a senior reporter with Khalid Times newspaper here. And I've been covering crypto with a lot of interest. And yeah, the other question, can any, any of your panelists could answer this question for me. So in UAE, we have noticed a lot of operators coming here and wanting to oh, trade uh, in cryptocurrency and stuff like that. Uh, but my fear as a journalist is how, how does an investor, while on one hand, you have institutional investors like MasterCard, Visa, uh, you know, ad adopting cryptocurrency. And on the other hand, the individuals, because of the lack of uh, awareness, lack of uh, regulation, I don't know where does an individual investor go because it's ultimately your hard-earned money that you'll be investing. And is it really worth the risk? I don't know, maybe Dante can uh, answer this question to me. Because as an individual investor, I think every country owes a responsibility to ensure that the investor's money is protected. But I think there is a lack of regulation, lack of clarity too. And on the other hand, people are investing at the speed of light in cryptocurrency. Where does all this stand and where do we head to, Dante, if you could, or anyone else in the panel could answer my question. Dante, be over to you. Sure. Well, I'm happy, happy to provide an answer to that. First, begin with the point of this industry and the entirety of it may not be right for everyone, but everyone's rights to participate should be protected, point one. Point two, as a general matter, if to be an investor, we often have in the regulatory domain consumer protection standards that preclude people who do not already have money from participating in the world's most money-making, money-creating, and money-preserving assets. And so that's why so much of the cryptocurrency market has been and remains very much a protest vote to entrenched approaches on Wall Street and, and, and elsewhere around the world. Now, that doesn't mean that the industry should be given a complete pass and, and um, you know, nor should we, for, for that matter, solve with enforcement what can be solved with better risk disclosure facing the consumer. And so the advice to crypto investment would be the same of any other investment. Never invest more than you're prepared to lose and never invest in anything you do not understand. So it may not be right for everyone, 
but I believe very deeply in everyone's rights to participate. And sh it should also be worth mentioning that this has been the best performing asset class in the last decade. And, and so to have um, missed that partly because of consumer protection or, or regulatory paternalism or for individual fear or the lack of wherewithal, I think would have been a miss. And so the more it becomes a part of the regulatory perimeter, the better. And the UAE particularly has been um, very active lately in inviting uh, major companies to invest in the UAE. Okay, Dante, thank you very much for that really full response. I'm going to cross now to the journalist from Business AM who's in Nigeria. Please, can you introduce yourself and pose your question? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Charles Abwede. I write um, for Business AM here in Nigeria. Okay, um, I have a few questions, and uh, I didn't want to um, appreciate everyone on this um, um, panel, everyone on the panel here. You guys have been giving us, you know, the, um, the the hints, you know, the way to go as regards to the, the this cryptocurrency or this digital asset. Um, to begin with, well, anyone can answer. Um, I just have like, four questions here, though. Anyone, you know, could could answer any. And um, one of the questions will be, you know, specifically um, directed down to um, um, Hester. Who happens to be um, the commissioner? Definitely, um, that will be my second question. So to start with, the very first question is: um, We're talking about um, talking about crypto, talking about uh, blockchain, blockchain technology, talking about you know like say banks, crypto exchanges, and the likes. I actually want to know how do we harness the power of crypto? You know, the crypto, this currency as a digital asset or as an asset class. How do we harness the power, you know, alongside the, um, the technologies involved, you know, some of the crypto exchanges we have, you know, around and other um, 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 virtual asset providers? How do we harness the power just to make, you know, uh, uh, this currency mm -hmm. and the exchanges or the, uh, or the technologies involved to okay, be more so efficient and that transparent? Thank you. I'm going to put that question right to Hester uh, right now. So how do we unleash the power of cryptocurrency, but at the same time ensure that it's still transparent? Yeah, Charles, that's a good question. And I think those are some of the, the, the issues that people are wrestling with now, right? So the technology itself really lends itself to transparency, to open source technology, to allowing everyone to have equal access to information. And so um, we should we should be working to figure out how that how how we can you know hold people accountable, make sure that that's actually um, being carried out. And and I think if you take a look at a, a recent paper by uh, Professor Chris Brummer, he kind of thinks through how we can actually um, take advantage of the technology to do disclosure better, to achieve our investor protection objectives better. Um, so that's what I'd like to see us do, is, is view the technology as a way to better achieve our regulatory objectives. Hester, thank you, and thanks very much to Charles for that question. We're going to cross to South Africa now and uh, take a question from a uh, journalist at the Daily Maverick. Please introduce yourself and uh, tell us what you'd like to ask. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks um, for taking my question. And so it's been a fascinating discussion. And I, I mean, I just, uh, it does, uh, demonstrate, I think, to all of us how, how, how we're just feeling our way in the dark. Um, but uh, I guess my question is really about um, how, how the utility of, uh, of cryptocurrencies. Um, the, um, at the moment, I think, if I'm guessing here, but you, you will correct me if I'm wrong, most people have bought cryptocurrencies, the people who have, have bought them for investment reasons or for savings reasons, I guess, or for... Uh, just for the fun of it, um, the but the real utility of uh, crypto is is uh, is uh, is within trade um, and uh, and ha having a, a very a, a quick, secure, cheap way of transacting. Um, I just wondered what you thought the uh, the the blockages were uh, to uh, to encouraging uh, crypto as a trading mechanism, not just as a saving mechanism. Um, and it does strike me that uh, that if it is increasingly used as a trading me mechanism, it would be, you know, in effect, in competition with national currencies. And if it's in uh, um, in, a, in 
uh, competition with national currencies, governments are, are going to be inclined to try and restrict it. Or, or okay. uh, am I wrong there? Well, uh, let me put thanks. that question uh, first. Rather of all, vague, but you get okay. the point. Certainly do get the point. I'm going to put that question um, very briefly first to Dante, and then I'd like uh, uh, to get the view of Doug as well. Dante first. Sure. Of all. Well, it, it is a powerful question. In fact, I mean, this question of sovereign money and competition coming from privately issued digital currencies or cryptocurrencies has animated a global conversation among central banks, of which around 90% of them are in some degrees of experimentation or piloting of digitizing their national thrift. But it then begs the question in terms of the, the most fundamental utility of these innovations, I think is evident in um, the, the horrible tragedy we see taking place in the Ukraine, where when all other systems fail, digital assets, blockchain-based finance, and digital currencies are a form of banking and a form of value that travel with you. Armed with little more than an internet-connected mobile device, that's a very, very powerful opportunity. Uh, and you see it playing out in the most extreme cases, like in Ukraine, we have uh, pilot projects at scale in Venezuela, and I think these types of um, innovations have huge implications to be a part of a new humanitarian blueprint for how money moves, again, back to a world in which our financial needs are always on, but the banking system takes bank holidays. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And Doug, very briefly, what's your take on this? Well, I think, you know, it's important to get terminology correct. You know, they're called cryptocurrencies or perhaps fiat, crypto, you know, those terms are wrong. It, it is not a currency basically anywhere. Currencies are only issued by governments. Um, if governments do digitize, as Dante said, that could be a cryptocurrency, but you know, to date there really aren't any. I'm not sure I would call them in competition with them. Um, looking solely at the United States, the Fed does not measure cryptocurrency as part of its M measurement, deciding on what is the actual money that's in circulation when it uh, uses that calculation to formulate monetary policy. Um, that being said, it clearly is an asset class. Mm -hmm. People are investing in it. Um, there's a lot of leverage in the system that has built up. Um, one of the problems, though, is um, it's not one or, you know, this may not be a problem for some people. It, it's not really running through either the banking system or the investment advisory <laughs> system that's been in place in the United States for a long time. So um, as acting controller Sue said in a speech last week, most of the investments being done by low and moderate income people mm -hmm. and disproportionately of persons of color, which leads really to a question of whether people understand the risks and know what they're getting into. OK, thank you so much, Doug. And I'm afraid we've run out of time for this conversation. Thank you so much to all of our panellists for taking part. It's been a really fascinating discussion.